Good morning to everyone here. I, I do think it's, it's intriguing that I've managed to interrupt Nora Jones for a talk on chaos engineering. <laughs> um, that's certainly written in the stars. Uh, who has seen me speak before? Thank goodness no one raised their hands. I can completely make up a new persona, one that is one that didn't drink as much in the bar last night as someone else did. Anyway, right, so today um, is the very last talk of my tour. That's the first thing to mention. I have ridden 6,326 miles now on that motorcycle out there <laughs> across the States. I started in San Francisco about 30 days ago. and. It's been absolutely epic. I, I just want to sort of drop into the first part of this talk. It's not really closely related to the talk, but I want to say that there's, that I had a lot of expectations of this tour. I thought I would see a lot of stuff, and I did. But what is more profound is I, I met people that I will now have lifelong friendships with. It's the most amazing thing. You, you, if you live, if you're local, and I mean by local, I mean this hemisphere, if you're in this hemisphere, this country is absolutely phenomenal. And it's, you should be extremely proud of this country. Not, not because of political ideals, not because of anything complicated, but just the experience. Get on a motorcycle, get in a car. My motorcycle's better. And meet people out there, because they're amazing. They, they all have different views, and they're all right. <laughs> OK, so this talk was loosely called Loving Your Non-Functionals. And so I start with a question. Who here has spent one dollar today? Raise your hands. Yeah, most people have. Even if you haven't, if you, if you think you haven't, you probably have. Um, who has spent a thousand dollars today? Oh, I imagine you might have. <laughs> um, who works for a company that for one hour of their life, if the system goes down, They've already spent $100,000. That's crazy, isn't it? Imagine that's your money. Imagine you're sitting there going, I spent a dollar today, or I, well, actually it's you know, Starbucks, $10 on coffee. And someone goes, actually, there's a surcharge of $1,000 to do this. And for the next hour, well, statistically, when you read up on it, that's what you'll spend, or that's what a company will spend when the system doesn't work. So what I'm talking about today, I love the fact we call it non-functional. <laughs> Without it, nothing functions. But we call it non-functional because we think it's separate. And that's why I put it in those annoying sort of, you know, speech marks because it's not non-functional. It's the reason the functions happen. And if they don't happen, it costs you a lot of money. And this whole talk, apart from the fact I, I built it up over the tour, this whole talk comes from the fact that I've struggled. I, I do a lot of training and consultancy. And when you do training and consultancy, you get the worst of all worlds. Number one, people pretend they're listening to you. Number two, you know they're not. And so it's very difficult to motivate people to do the right thing. I would stand on stage like this, this huge, great stage, right between the two, um, on the stage, and you go, you should consider circuit breakers. Otherwise, your software might not work. And everyone goes, yeah, good idea. And they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't go and do it. <laughs> so, what I'm actually talking about here is how you get people to care about something that is considered non-functional, but is crucial to not spending that $1,000 in the next, sorry, $100,000 in the next hour. So imagine, we start, we start this talk. In the next hour, somebody, somewhere, has lost $100,000 because they haven't listened to me. That's how valuable this is. Right, let's get into it. Okay, 
First of all, I live and exist on Twitter. I have no other personality, I have no other life. Twitter is my entire existence. You can follow me, but if you do follow me, you'll follow me briefly. There's reasons you'll walk away. I won't take it personally, I know what it's like. I am a binge tweeter. I tweet good stuff, admittedly, I think it's good stuff, uh, about software development and everything we do, but I do it like nothing for about two weeks and then I will fill your timeline with ideas. And you'll go, what is this insane rambling? Cut him off. So just saying, you can follow me, but I will take no, no offense if you, do, if you stop. And the reason I'm on the stage, I think, is because I built this thing called the Chaos Toolkit, which is directly related to that not spending $100,000 in the next hour. It's a toolkit that says, if you follow and understand this technique and this discipline, if you get to love your non-functionals, if you see them as an advantage to your game, then this is the way to do it. This is the one of the ways to do it, and it's a good way to do it. So it's free, it's open source, you can go grab it. Okay, and when it comes to this tour, I said I did 6,000 miles. By the way, if you notice in the top left, it says 5,000 miles. That's why we can't estimate. I thought it was five, I put it in the Google, it said five, empirically said 5,000 miles. In fact, it said 4,700. I thought I'd round it up. But it doesn't, it doesn't calculate for things like riding around the town. Or it doesn't calculate for going to the Grand Canyon, because you fancy it. But just a, a quick shout out, really. I have started to at least write up the entire experience of this, this tour in this journal. So you can grab it for free, it's free. You can go on Lean Pub and grab it right now. But if you're ethical, you might choose to give some money to it. Now, good news is, I don't get any money from that. All the money goes to girls who code, apart from what is the small chunk that Lean Pub take. But in that book, you will, you will, you will feel my 6,300 miles. <laughs> and you will also have all the things I talk about today, they're all in the book too. Okay. So, non-functionals. Who here is an architect? I've been there, right? It's one of the most difficult jobs in the world because you're spread very thin across all the teams you work in. And there's one fatal flaw in the job description of being an architect. It doesn't say it in the description. You don't see it in the spec when you sign up. The bottom line is, you will be ignored. You will say, do this, and they'll go, yeah. And they promptly don't do it. You'll say, consider this, and they'll say, we will. And then they don't do it. And so the difficulty is, how do you make, in a good way, make people do the right thing when you're an architect and they will not listen. Chaos engineering is a wonderful force, forcing function. It gives you the power, gives everyone the power, to improve and consider the things we don't want to worry about. We like to not worry about them. In software development, we like to build abstractions around these things and say, don't worry about it anymore. But the fact is we have to worry about it. And so chaos engineering reminds us that we need to worry about it. So we have chaos engineering now for a very good reason. The fact that people are on these amazingly large stages talking about this, it's the time to have the conversation. It's not, it's not just luck, it's not just someone going, I have an opportunity now to write a book or whatever. There's two things we want from our systems when it comes to non-functional characteristics. And you won't see this on the new features we're going to ship tomorrow, but it's all implied. I want to ship features, but I also want to maintain our trust 
and confidence in the system. That's difficult. It's more difficult than it used to be. We've obtained, we have paid the price of making this difficult. Let me explain. <laughs> We've paid the price because production is our enemy. Now, I, I'm at odds with some people in the industry at the moment about this. But the way I view production is that it's a, a war, a war scenario. When I drop my naive little grunt piece of software into this scenario, it ain't gonna survive. It's the one place it won't work. I love the fact that we build pipelines of software and expect that when we drop it into the war zone, it's gonna be okay. I saw a wonderful, I was, I was party to a wonderful discussion, well, a long time ago now, where there was a group of people going, we built this pipeline. And we're going to do this, 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 and this, and then it will work in production. And I watched the senior expert in the room, and his body language alone was interesting. Because it was like this. And all I could hear was a muttering. Every time they said it will work in production, it was like, it won't. Now, that, that's where it goes and it doesn't work. <laughs> and that's the truth. So if we can accept that, that production is the least likely place your software will work, it's under conditions there that you could not possibly predict. And that's problematic. We have just spent a lot of money in this industry achieving microservices, et cetera, for good reasons. And now we're dropping things into production and we're wondering why they don't work comes back to our non-functionals. I would also say that this talk is about a mindset change. I want you to think differently about production. Not only do I want you to appreciate that it hates us, and when I say hates, up, hates us, it hates you. It knows you. It knows when you're on a date. It knows when you're asleep. It's kind of like Santa Claus, but evil. Production is not it's not oblivious to the fact that you don't want to worry about it. It knows. And it's like a really needy partner <laughs> that's saying, worry about me, worry about me, worry about me. And I would say that the first mindset change in this, the way, the way to make this work, is to think like a motorcyclist. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Who drives a car legally? Good, that's good. Most of the hands stayed up. That's awesome. Um, some went down, which I'm going to talk to you later. Uh, so you, in, the, in the UK, anyway, in, in where I come from, they teach you when you're, you're driving a car, they say, just assume no one can see you. Drive defensively because they can't see you. But that's not good enough for software developers in production. What you need to do is adopt the mindset of a motorcyclist. When you're taught to ride a motorcycle, you're taught that they can see you, and they want you dead. <laughs> it's not paranoia if it's true. So that's what you need to do when it comes to production. Appreciate that you're dropping your code into a war zone, and it does want you dead. It doesn't want you to work there. It wants, it wants you not to work there. So you have to think like a motorcyclist. That's the one first lesson of this talk. And it's the only way I can possibly justify riding 6,000 miles. OK, but why? Right, you, could be, you could be forgiven for thinking, maybe we could avoid this. Maybe if we built the perfect system, if we built something better than what we have right now, or thought about it more, then we could avoid the problem. Now, I'm going to abuse a system here called Kinevin. This is a way of, for me, this is a way of thinking about systems. And I've got some bad news for you. You probably hope you're down in that bottom right quadrant. It'd be lovely to be in simple. Because someone could say, just do X, and it would be better. You wouldn't have to think about it. You wouldn't have to consider it. You could just do it, and it would be better. 
The problem is you're not there. Unless you're writing Hello World for a living, and if you are, well done. <laughs> but you're probably not writing Hello World for a living, um, and so we're not down there. You probably think, or suspect at least, you're up there and complicated. You know, you think of your life and your system and everyone's working on it as a complicated environment. The good thing about complicated, the reason it's attractive, is there are good practices. Someone like me can come along and go, try this, you'll probably be better. But you're not there. Sorry, you're probably not. If you're at a conference like this, you're not there. You, if you've been doing anything like these buzzwords, <laughs> whether you're calling microservices, mini services, micro lists, mini lists, whatever, and they are in any sense conforming to the constraints of cloud native, then you're not in complicated anymore. You're very likely in complex. Now, in complex, it's more interesting. Because the best we can do is work with the system, figure it out. As a consultant, and I warn you, that's a confession. As a consultant, when you're working in that sort of quadrant, the best you can say is, try this. I hope it will be better. There are very few consultants that are that honest. But when you factor in everything around your system, not just the, just the technology, the platform, the process, but everything, people around it, you're probably at least in complex. Or at least you think you are. Because I have bad news for you. You're not there. If you're building anything you would label as cloud native microservices that evolve really quickly because that was the point of doing them, when you add, <coughs> add that up, you end up realizing that you have to accept change as a regular forcing function on your software. The phrase I used to use as a software developer, and I still do, is that we should have a mantra in this industry. And it should go like this. We don't know what we're doing, and they don't know what they want. And that is situation normal. When you understand that at a deep level, you're not building software, you're building constantly the wrong thing. It's getting righter, hopefully. You're getting better at it, but you're building something that's wrong all the time. And the only way this industry works, and that's why we call it agile, is because we know we're getting it wrong, <laughs> and we're going to adjust as we go forward. So change is an absolute constant and essential. I used to have, I, I did a degree at Oxford. I don't expect in any way for that to be a big deal. But I did this degree, and I had the best professor I've ever met. And he was one of those professors that wore the gown. You know when someone's authoritative when they come to the stage and they're wearing a gown. Looks like I just woke up, you know. Proper gown and a hat. And you he, go, there's only one thing we know about software. We're getting it wrong, and everything changes. And then they would proceed for the rest of the term telling you how to get it right. And yet they know it's wrong. <laughs> so when I teach courses, when I, when I talk to people about this, I say, stop thinking you're getting it right. Assume what you're building today is wrong. And tomorrow, you're going to need to change it quite considerably. Unfortunately, that leaves us with a problem. <laughs> It means not only are we building complex systems, but every now and then, like all the time, it shifts into the chaotic. And the chaotic world is a bad place to be. Because in the chaotic world, we have to make up new ideas. We have to invent stuff. And that's hard. It's expensive. We thought we were building an online booking system or whatever. And now we're having to invent what is good in that, in that system to make it better. So that sounds to me like we're spending money on the wrong thing. But it's tricky, because if we wanted all those things I just mentioned, that's where we end up. So wouldn't it be great 
if we had a technique that engineered us out of chaos into just the merely complex. Now, if there's one thing we shouldn't do in this industry, it's name things. We are terrible at it. Microservices, stop. No one cares how big they are. So calling them that, bad idea. Cloud Native, also, let's, let's, go, let's call out the elephant in the room. We took a wonderful renaissance in data access technologies, and we called it by what it isn't. We called it NoSQL. Worse than that, it's not what it's not. <laughs> because occasionally, SQL's in there, and it's not a problem. So could we stop naming things? We're clearly not good at this. And chaos engineering suffers from this particular problem. Chaos engineering is an extremely great technique, but it sounds like we're causing problems. I'm going to talk later about how you talk to the business about this. But if you say to someone, do you want to engineer some chaos? The natural answer is no. <laughs> Why would you do this? So we drop, part of this message is don't worry about that. We are engineering ourselves out of chaos. It's a great term when you understand the context, which unfortunately means it's a terrible term because you have to understand the context. We're trying to deal with the fact that we have chaos and we need a technique that gets us out of it. Okay, why do we have this chaos? Well, we want trust and confidence in our systems. And resiliency is what we look for. We look for a system that can give us some guarantees. Unfortunately, there's a lot of attacks on that, and you're probably familiar with some of those attacks. If you've ever used the chaos monkey, you know what infrastructure chaos feels like. Now, it's fair to say that is where some resiliency problems can occur, but actually, that's a small proportion. You know, clouds, although we say you can't guarantee much in the cloud, they're better than most things at keeping those guarantees. So anyone who's seen the tooling around chaos engineering in the large and has seen the chaos monkey will assume that this is where all the problems occur. But it's not true. There's also the platform. Whatever you're using to try not to worry about stuff is also subject to failure. So if you're using Kubernetes, has anyone here destroyed the control plane and seen what happens next? You should. If you want to ask that question, what happens then? That's just the platform. There's also the code that we write. We are great at writing code that will kill our system. We're experts at it. And we should build software that is aware that anyone else who updates the software might kill it. And that's what happens at the application level. But there's another level, which is singly the biggest attack on your system ever. It's the one that makes the headlines, which is you. The people, the practices, the process, everything that goes into destroying, I mean, sorry, updating, destroying your software. You are great at this. Whenever I, I love it, I, I watch the industry, and I watch the sort of newspapers and stuff, that, newspapers, the blogs that come out, and I, I see, you know, whenever anyone says, this can't happen, S3 can't die, and then it does. And that's the sentence. It's always started with, it can't happen, and then it follows through with, it will. And it's usually because of us. I did a talk, before I did this tour, like before the 6,000 miles, I did a talk in Oslo. And I asked the room, who here has had a non-functional issue, like a, a, a problem in production, an incident? And I've never seen anyone so keen to get on stage in my life. This one individual, bless him, he, 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 like, he came straight up and he said, it was me. I did this. He had written a command line where one character was the difference between success and failure. 
he put a G when there shouldn't be a G. It killed the master node of a high performance computing cluster, which killed everyone's work for the last two weeks in a pharmaceutical scenario. So it's a big deal, a lot of money lost. But then you sit back and you go, well, one character, you can either go, don't let that person near the keyboard again, right? Push them out of the room. You don't do this anymore. Or you can go, actually, the system's wrong. We need to improve the system. Based on, you know, talk, talking about what um, Adrian was talking about this morning, Sidney Decker would say, the system has failed, not the person. But the truth is, it's us that causes the most chaos in our systems. But as a chaos engineer, that's not the problem. What you do is you sit back and go, good. Because if we cause a little bit of chaos in a controlled and careful way, then we can get better. What we don't want to do is exercise our disaster recovery in a disaster. Instead, it would be great to exercise these things when we know they're happening. Okay, so in terms of how you might get started, I've got some good news for you. No talk is complete unless it can disagree with Einstein. Ignore the man. <laughs> My German is pretty loose, but when it comes to that phrase, I believe it sort of says, any idiot can deal with normal or simple, but it takes a genius to deal with chaos. Good news, it doesn't. It takes a mindset, a process, a few practices, some tools, and for me, a minimum bar. So I'm going to share all those with you right now. I've already started you on your journey towards the mindset. You're hopefully all thinking like motorcyclists right now. When you write your code, you're going to drop it into the street outside in Chicago where everyone is trying to run over it. That's the first change. When it comes to the mindset, though, it's based on a philosophy. Now, I have to warn you about this. We, don't, we rarely examine our philosophies in software. We have basic assumptions that something is good and no one talks about them. So I like to draw those out on stage. And the mindset that I've gone on about for about five years now is we should stop building robust and resilient systems. That sounds wrong, right? The problem with robust and resilient as it comes at a cost. The best robust and resilient system you could build never changes. It's only robust and resilient because nothing changes. It's all predictable. But that we all know that's not what production looks like. We're surprised constantly in production. So if you were to build a system, you wouldn't you wouldn't, certainly wouldn't build fragile. You wouldn't, if anyone here has ever like rebooted their laptop before a keynote talk, you know, that moment you update the operating system unscheduled just before you go on stage, that's what fragile feels like. It's not good, so we don't do that. But we also believe we're just trying to aim for robust and resilient, but it comes at a cost. If it's robust and resilient, it can't fail. It can't change. So for me, when I build a system, I'm constantly looking at how we make it anti-fragile, which is the opposite of fragile. But it doesn't ignore change. It encompasses change. In fact, change is a good factor. The system needs to change because we're getting it wrong, remember? I told you that there's a mantra in this industry. You're getting it wrong. You'll get it righter. Anti-fragile is the only system that accommodates that. So that's a mindset change. So we're building systems that don't avoid failure. They thrive on it. They thrive on the fact that they are changing. But there's a problem. We build these systems, and we don't know what we don't know. Don't worry, that's pretty normal. As a motorcyclist, 
when I get on that bike later to take it to Eagle Rider, take it back to the, to the base, I assume that I will get there. I really hope I do. But I also know I don't know. I don't know what the conditions of the road are. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's going to swerve in front of me. But I know I don't know that. Now, in software, we could do with a technique that appreciates we don't know what we don't know. When we drop, when the rubber hits the road and we're in production, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we need a technique that helps us deal with the fact we don't know what's going to happen. And that's what chaos engineering does. It's part of the mindset. You have to know you don't know. You have to let go of that little voice in your head that says, yeah, we're sure it'll work. You don't know that. And the way to overcome that is through loops of learning. So what we do is we drop the code in production. We do testing, right? Before you go, go to a production, you test. Testing isn't good enough. Testing tells you that you know something and it's true. But I've just said you don't know. And you don't know what you don't know, which is worse. So when you drop something into production, what techniques do you use deal with the fact that you don't know what's going to happen? We call that double loop learning. Single loop learning is, like I say, strategy, do it, validate strategy. Double loop learning says, actually, the assumptions that built the strategy, let's look at those two. So chaos engineering isn't just chaos testing. Testing is part of the game, but that's when you know something. Chaos engineering is about what you don't know. OK, so in a process perspective, now I, I use this because I, I don't completely agree with it. It's like any good process. You put it up and you go, there's problems with that. Number one, this is the scientific method. When we drop something to production, we do chaos engineering because we're exploring what might happen. We don't know. The problem with science is it pretends it starts with a hypothesis. And it doesn't. I have a lot of friends who are scientists. And when they're honest and drunk, they will turn around and say, no. Nah. We start by prodding it. We go, this is the, the theory, or this is the biological example. And we go, huh, that's different. Wasn't supposed to do that. And when we realize that when we prod it, it's not right, we then form a hypothesis to make us sound like we know what we're doing. And that's what we do in, that's what we do in chaos engineering. We prod the system, more often than not, we prod it and go, huh, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> And then we form a hypothesis, and then we go, ah, no, that, that really doesn't fit when we run the experiment. So this is a basic process, but don't get too hung up on hypothesis, is what I'm saying. Number two, communicate to your team. I would say that should be at least 0 0.5. If you'd start doing chaos engineering as an isolated person or group, so you start looking at a system and going, what happens when I delete this, or I kill this, or whatever? If you do that without anyone knowing, you're not a chaos engineer. You're a sadist. And you will fail, <laughs> because no one will want you around. If you turn around and go, I delete, yeah, they go, thank you, stop. Because what you've done is you've now you basically become the problem, rather than e exploring the problem. So when it comes to communication, you start there first. You sit with everyone and go, what worries us about production? What's the thing that's keeping us up at night? Or what should keep us up at night? Or what happened last Sunday? When you ask those questions, you then come up with great sort of a breeding ground of ideas where you go, we don't trust this system much, which is OK. At least we know that now. Then chaos engineering is for addressing that. So when it comes to communication, I would shift that from 2 probably to 0 0.5. Then you go and do stuff to the system. 
Now, why would you bother? You could just sit there and logically work it out and go, I think if that happens, that would be bad. But no one cares if you tell them. Back to those non-functuals that we're supposed to love. It's no good to, when I'm in a class, and I'm teaching people, it's no good me saying, use a circuit breaker, it's a good idea. I have to show them that if they don't use it, they will have pain. So we run experiments for two reasons. We run it to, to figure out if we're, if we're right. We figure out if there's really a weakness in the system. But we also do it because nothing, actually there's a different phrase for this. In production, everyone can hear you scream. And so we want to make the problem happen where everyone notices that it's an issue. So in chaos engineering, often people will say, do it in production. That's the place for it to occur. And there's a reason for that. It's where everyone notices it. But if you can, if you get mature at this, you start actually doing it somewhere else. You do it in staging, and then there's as much leverage as anywhere else. Once you've run an experiment, once you've realized there's a weakness in the system, then you can look at results and go, OK, we need to improve this. The fifth item there, it says we start small. It's a weird sort of phrase to say increasing the scope. But you don't start with running Chaos Monkey unchained. I've had that phone call where someone goes, just run Chaos Monkey. OK, fine. Why? OK, good. Um, in production, killed everything. I knew it would. And I sit there and go, why did you do it then? If you know it's going to take everything down, don't do it. <laughs> That's not the point. We're not here to go, we're wonderful at killing stuff. We're here to go, we think it will survive, and we want to explore that. And that's what happens when you increase the scope. You start with a survival strategy. Something's broken, but we keep going. And yes, that's true. And then we go, OK, what happens if we now break a bigger piece? Because we think it will survive. That should be your mentality. You don't do a chaos experiment unless you think the system will survive. The last point there, I think, is crucial. It's easy to look at the toolbox even my toolkit of chaos engineering and go, everything needs to be automated. But in truth, this is, a, this is a people process. Chaos engineering is a people thing. And it's about, the only reason we ever automate it is because we don't want to waste people's lives doing it all the time. And we can't afford that. So it's, it's in that bracket of continuous subjects. You've got continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous chaos. Because what you're doing is you're constantly building the trust and confidence in a system that is being continuously delivered. But we only automate when it becomes too painful or expensive to do so. Anything else? Right, this is a new arc, um, ethics. Don't worry, normally when I drop ethics into a talk, everyone goes, huh. But it's important. Because this is the reason you will fail. If you do chaos engineering, this is the reason it might not work. Everything else is fine. You can use the tools, techniques, everything that goes with it. This is the thing that will kill it. I was watching a discussion on Twitter. And it was more of a, a vaguely heated argument. It was like a lukewarm argument. And that on Twitter is not profound, right? Everyone argues on Twitter about something. But I was watching it because it was interesting. And it started, well, the reason I got interested is because both sides were right. One side was saying, you need a chaos engineering group. You need people that are dedicated to the perspective of chaos engineering to do this well. And the other side were going, yeah, but we also would like everyone to have this mentality to not expect things to work in production, et cetera. And I was sitting there going, you're both arguing, but you're both correct. And so whenever that happens, I have had a, I've had a, I have a strange career. One of my, one of my career paths was as, as a counselor. And ironically, a marriage counselor. And if you know me well enough, 
That's irony. <laughs> Both of my ex-wives would disagree that I'm any good at this. But <clears throat> whenever two people are arguing and they're both right, there's common ground they're not aware of. And so what I was looking at here is watching these people arguing, going, well, where's the common ground? They both care about something, but they're not saying it. And the fact is, what they were arguing about was this. What they were saying is, whoever does chaos needs a portion of the downside of doing chaos. You can't do it from a distance. If you do, you're back to being a sadist. So whenever you're doing chaos engineering, if you're going to produce chaos in a system to prove there's a weakness, you need to take part emotionally, physically, part of the game. You have to go, I will be subjected to whatever we find. You take part of the responsibility of fixing it. Even if you can't do it yourself, you have to be part of the game. Because if you don't, no one will let you do chaos engineering. Everyone will sit back and go, we don't want them. Because all they do is hurt stuff. They make our lives hell. We're back to the idea of a QA versus development group. So when it comes to chaos, we don't recreate that problem. We allow every side to take a piece of the problem with them. Feel it too. So this is actually, I can't emphasize this enough, this is the reason it works or it doesn't. So if you're, in, if you're thinking, I'll do chaos and it'll be fun, I'll go home at 6 p.m., 5 p.m., whatever, and I'll have left them with the problem. <laughs> no. You'll be there with them going, we found this weakness. I'm going to help you as best I can to explore it and make it better. Good news. This is not Scrum. We don't have, and please, if anyone's thinking about setting up a certification program for chaos engineering, I will have a word with you outside. I'll, I, I just don't think you should do that, ever. So the good news is we only need to know roughly two things to do this, two practices. Number one, game days. And number one here is the most crucial thing you can even take away from this talk. Because game days are great fun. Now, I'm a proper geek. It's not just the geek on a Harley for a reason. Yeah, it's not just, not just a good name. I've, I love Dungeons and Dragons. Now, the reason I like Dungeons and Dragons is you set up a scenario. You have a bunch of people involved, and you say, what happens next? And you see. This is actually how Stephen King writes books. Best-selling author, he gets a whole bunch of ideas of who people are first, puts them in a scenario, and goes, what happens next? and he writes a book for the next few months. Well, that's what game days are. You have to be Stephen King, but not that, you know, not that best-selling. You can have fun with it. You start with going, what happens if? And then you do it in staging, and you see what happens. And it affects the whole socio-technical system. Everything will change. In chaos engineering, most of the weaknesses I've found are in the people, practices, and processes. I'll give you an example. I went to a company where I noticed that the playbooks, the things that they use in an emergency scenario, was in a room. And that room had a door. That door had a lock. And that lock had a key. And so I locked the door. And, I, and then I did a game day. I said, you know, things are broken in staging, stroke production. How do we deal with this? And a few savvy people in the room were like, well, we go, to, we go get these playbooks. Well, what if the door's locked? And it was. I learned two things from this chaos experiment. Number one, stop people before they break a door down. Number two, most of the weaknesses are human created. And so it's great fun to explore those things. And it makes it felt. When you see people do this, they get it. It's all what, I could turn as a consultant and go, you shouldn't have your playbooks in a room with a lock. You should put them out available to everyone at any moment in time. But everyone's going to ignore that, like any non-functional concern. It's ignorable. Chaos engineering makes it unignorable. It makes it clear, present, and painful. But. 
Game days are expensive. They're easy to do, cheap to do. You don't need any tooling. You just need yourselves. You can do it tomorrow. Please do. Well, do it when everyone knows it's happening. Again, not sadists. But the problem with game days is everyone has to be involved all the time to do it. You'll find stuff out, you'll learn, it'll be great. But you can't do it every day because people have jobs to do. So we automate those sorts of things where we want to keep that trust and confidence, but we want to keep it without costing us everybody involved all the time. And that's where the automated chaos experiments come in. You're, you're running things constantly. The, the phrase I use is we're doing small amounts of disaster recovery. Small, but constantly, because then we know the system delivers. I mentioned a minimum bar. Now, for those of you that are close to the stage, or actually probably those who are in, uh, far from the stage, you probably can see it better because it's a big stage. I'm a short individual. And being a short individual, when I go to theme parks, it's nerve wracking. Not because of the rides. But as I go towards a ride, there's always this line on the wall that says you need to be this high to go on this ride. And as I walk closer to it, that Line gets higher. <laughs> and at some point, I'm going to get this position with me and my daughter, who's nine. She's already quite tall. I'm going to be able to get and go, right, you, you go on, Marley, because daddy's too short for the ride. As I get older, that's going to happen. But that's what I mean by a minimum bar. You need to be this tall to do this. And that minimum bar is great observability. Now, this comes with a caveat. You can do game days that will tell you you've got bad observability. <laughs> if you run a game day where you destroy something in staging and you ask people to figure out and solve the issue, the first thing you understand very quickly is they don't know what the system does. In fact, that can be an improvement straight off the bat. I used to get asked a lot, how do we get developers to write good logging? Make them the consumer of the logs and they'll be better at it. Better than that, make them do a game day. When they have to diagnose a problem in production, they'll know that what they're kicking out is terrible and they'll want it to be better. So that's the caveat here is that you can do game days to increase observability. Once you've got good observability, you can then start doing automated chaos engineering and get far better that way and explore technical weaknesses beyond the people involved. And the reason we need observability and not just management monitoring, the problem with management monitoring is it just gives me blinky lights. It says green or red, and red isn't always bad. When you look at a dashboard and it says that, you go, okay, it seems all right. But that's not the point. I want to be able to ask questions. In a game day, people are gonna be asking all the time, how do we know this? What happened? I did a game day recently where I caused a bug, buggy commit to go into the pipeline. Got through, perfect testing on it, and it caused an issue. They wanted to ask the question, what happened? How did this occur? Now think about that, that isn't about production having an issue. That's about how did this get in there? So you need to ask open questions about your whole system. Now there's a couple of tools I use to do this. One's Humio, and they're out there at the moment, lovely people. Go and chat to them. Humio, for me, it's, there's a lot of things it does. But the one thing I love is I can ask open questions all the time. I can sit there in a game day and go, let's have a look at the logs, and I can interrogate them as they fly past. So that's, that's important to me. There's another tool out there called Weave Cloud. Weave Cloud does lots of things. The one thing I care about is when we wrote this article, was I really cared about asking the question, who did what? Not because I want to blame anyone, but I'd like to know, given the system, the experiment we're dealing with, who changed it last? What was the thing that happened? Because that might have been the cause of the issue we're seeing. Now, think about your own systems. How many times, can you ask that question? Can you answer it, more importantly? Can, if someone says to you, what was the last change that went into production, do you know? Do you know who did it? Do you know what they did? That's the observability I'm talking about. 
When you do chaos engineering, you, you want to know those things. Weave Cloud is a great way of doing it. OK. Let me tell you the other reason it's going to fail <laughs> when it comes to chaos engineering. Um, when you talk to non-technical people and say, I'm going to do chaos engineering, they will usually answer with, please don't. I, I work with a lot of banks in London. And when I turn around and say, I'm here to do chaos engineering, they say, what? No, 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 we don't want chaos. We had that. It's 2008. Done. We don't want that anymore. So here's a, a little tip. And I think it's probably one of the most important messages of this talk, actually, is when it comes to chaos engineering for the business, don't call it chaos engineering. Because it sounds like we're causing problems. I have a new phrase for you. Continuous, limited scope, disaster recovery. It's the same game. It's exactly the same way I think. It's the same mindset. It's everything. But it gets a budget. <laughs> chaos engineering won't. It chaos, don't worry, you can introduce it later on. I've got several banks in London right now that I consult with, and I'm sure at some point they're going to realize <laughs> they're doing chaos engineering. But they would never call it that. No one's going to put a line item in a bank going, we do chaos. But they will do continuous limited scope disaster recovery. You could even say premeditated disaster recovery if you want, if you make it more, even more impressive. But it, it sounds like a, a, a small point, but it's a really important thing. If you're going to go to a company, don't say, I want to do chaos. Don't start with, I want to be the director of chaos. I am now a director of chaos, but that's because I own the company. <laughs> and therefore, I can give my title. My, my title can be anything I want. But even I wouldn't. If I was owning the company and someone said to me, I want to be a director of chaos, I'd say, you can do that somewhere else. <laughs> but if someone says to me, I want to do small amounts of disaster recovery in a careful, controlled, small way to explore how our system deals, I go, that sounds very sensible. If they say I want to do chaos engineering, I'd say, please don't. When it comes to exploring these things, don't start with, I'm going to hurt your system. I'm going to break things. No one wants that. But if you start from what worries you, and you talk about things that have actually happened recently, there's another little rule here. Don't do chaos engineering that's wacky. When you say to a group of people, we've just destroyed everything and it didn't survive, they'll go, yeah, it shouldn't. But if you say we did a small thing and it should have survived, then that's the learning cycle. OK, quick rules of Chaos Club. Number one, not about hurting things. It's about learning. I've already given you the point, point 0.5 on this, which is make sure you think about systems in the, in the, like a motorcyclist. But it's not about breaking things. It's about learning how the system deals. Number two, chaos should never be a surprise. You don't want to be the person that says, I broke stuff. Surprise and then go on holiday. That's not the point either. You're part of the learning cycle, so don't try and avoid it. And this is contentious. If you know, what ha if you know it's going to fail, don't do it. Don't be that person who said, I did Chaos Monkey in production, and it killed everything, and I knew it would. What you do is you start from, I've, I've, did, I've done this thing. We found something out. There's a weakness here. We need to improve the system. Very quickly, there's some, there are loads of tutorials and tools. If you haven't got the Chaos Engineering book, I'll give you a tip. Casey's going to be out there signing it later on. So go and grab a free copy. And I should point out, it's an e-book. It's free online anyway. But they've got printed versions, which is cool. I'm a big paper book fan. So they're out there, and he'll sign them for you. So that's, that's, the, that's the starting point. <laughs> this is how I teach it on my courses. <laughs> um, now, I have not seen the film, <laughs> nor have I read the book. And I'm, I'm honest, I really haven't. But I assume that the book goes like this. We're going to hurt the system to make it better. Is that how it works? Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, when I teach microservices, like I said, about non-functionals, it's very difficult to get people to care about the things they don't want to care about until you hurt the system. Then they care. 
So that's how we build it. Unfortunately, when we were working with Amazon, they didn't want to call a tutorial this. I think it's the best title for a tutorial ever. But no, we had to call it Applying Chaos Engineering. <laughs> But if you go to the website, right, you can just mentally translate it now into 50 shades of microservices. And it's about the same. Um, OK, so the point with here is just to leave you, really, the last point is the Chaos Toolkit's free and easy. It's for when your game days become too expensive. You can automate your game days using the Chaos Toolkit. You can drive them using any integrations you like. You can drive, as Gre Gremlin are out there as well, right, in the, in the foyer. Go and chat to them. You can drive Gremlin from the Chaos Toolkit. And there's a reason for that. We want to be able to help people to share and collaborate on Chaos, because it's a shared thing. It's not a surprise, remember? So you can go and do this now and have some fun with it. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's been an absolute pleasure. What an amazing surrounds. And also, if anyone wants a picture of themselves on a 1600cc motorcycle, you have like the next 10 minutes to do so before I take it back. Um, but thank you very much for your time, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.